Hey everyone, welcome back to another hardware news recap for the week. We have some information on NVIDIA thermal monitoring, Intel Comet Lake CPU details, uh, NVIDIA adding integer scaling with the new drivers, and then a couple of AMD stories like the RDNA white paper, which is worth checking out, and Lisa Sue commenting on Crossfire support. Before that, this video is brought to you by Audible. Audible has a massive audiobook library, including content that talks computers and games. Audible has an entire series from the official Computer History Museum, which we've actually toured in the past and can support as a leader in computer education. Audible also hosts the Ultimate History of Video Games, something I read back when researching GN content and can highly recommend for gaming and hardware enthusiasts. Audible's 30-day free trial can be unlocked at audible.com slash gamersnexus, or you can text gamersnexus, one word, to 500-500, where you'll get a free audiobook and two Audible originals, or click the link in the description below. So the first one's really easy. We talked about how AMD does junction temperature reading with the 5700 XT about a week ago, and none of that was new. That happened in February with the Radeon 7 card launch, but it was worth recapping because a lot of people with 5700 XT series and non-XT are getting these cards, whereas Radeon 7 wasn't really super wide availability. So after recapping that, we commented on how Andy's got junction temperature, which if you don't know, it's uh, as reported in GPU-Z, it's the single hottest temperature out of all of the sensors on the die. Radeon 7 had 64 of those that were checked. And then edge temperature is the other number that AMD reports. That is the literally the temperature at the edge of the die. So it's going to be cooler on average and is what was traditionally worked with and presented before. In that piece, we talked about how NVIDIA also has its GPU reporting and it's different from AMD's. So our original understanding was that NVIDIA reported GPU edge temperature. This is something that board partners told us several years ago. But actually, NVIDIA emailed us to note that, uh, hey, actually, we report the average temperature. So if you didn't know it, because we didn't, and so I assume most people don't, the difference in what NVIDIA reports through GPU-Z, it's actually not an edge temperature as a correction. That is an average of their sensors. Now, unfortunately, when we asked how many sensors do you have on the die uh, and how is the averaging done, things like that, uh, we couldn't get into any further details from NVIDIA. So all we know is that it's an average of all the sensors on the die. We don't know how many are on the die. It does the count of sensors changes based upon the die that's used, but that's what we know. So uh, it's better than an edge temp and it's still not a junction temperature, so you can't really linearly compare AMD to, to NVIDIA for thermals. And this is, I guess, a really quick aside that deserves a different video, but when trying to compare thermals between two different vendors, all you really need is power. This is a trap a lot of people fall into where they look at the temperature, which is dependent upon things like the cooler and also, obviously, where the temperature is read from. The only thing that matters is how much power does it draw. If it draws more power, then it's hotter, and that's the end of the, the story. The rest of it can be solved uh, or fought between with different cooling solutions. So anyway, that was the update we wanted to give. It's just it's uh, NVIDIA reports an average of its sensors, and then no further details were given. Intel details Comet Lake. So it's, it's well known that Intel uses lakes to name its processors, but unfortunately it has run out of lakes, and now is referring to uh, the processors by things like Coffee Lake, Whiskey Lake, Ice Lake, and Comet Lake. Many of these are names you probably know by now. Cascade Lake, can't forget that one. Everyone, everyone remembers Cascade Lake from Computex. Comet Lake is the 10th gen core uh, series CPUs on 14 nanometer process. It is not 10. It's got higher frequencies than the preceding Whiskey Lake. It's going to be used in notebooks. And Intel says that Comet Lake will increase perform, or I should say this iteration is used in notebooks. Uh, Intel says Comet Lake will increase performance by about 16% over the predecessor, and then also noted that this is from the frequency increases, but also a new memory controller, and then memory improvements as well in terms of the uh, maximum supported frequencies. So even still, with the near simultaneous launch of Ice Lake and Comet Lake, Intel inadvertently aims to confuse the buyer with two new product lines of different names at about the same time. Marketing is shaping up to target Ice Lake more towards gaming and notebooks, underscored by the Ice Lake IGP inclusion, while Comet Lake will be more for consumer and biz client. New processor names are also uh, confusing and include the Intel Core i7-10710U, the Core i7-10510U, the Core i7-10710U, 
10210U, the 10110U, the 10510Y, that was a close one, the 10310Y, and you can't forget the 10210Y or the 10110Y. Those are actually the names. And of course, following this generation, for the next generation, if you're wondering, these names are kind of confusing. They're getting, really, the numbers are getting longer. And uh, what's Intel going to do next? The next processors are going to be the Intel Core i7 8675309, and then the Douglas Adams Edition Core i7 42. That's, you heard it here first. Uh, NVIDIA adding integer scaling with new drivers. So NVIDIA has buckled under community demand and has added integer scaling. This is something that Intel, to its credit, did first just recently. And AMD is under pressure now from the community to do the same. So we'll probably see that from them eventually. But what's, what's going on here is basically if a game is run at a lower resolution than the display and GPU scaling, which is an option, is enabled in the NVIDIA control panel, the GPU will scale up the game to fit the screen. Although display scaling is actually the default, meaning that the display handles the upscaling. So a lot of users will probably never see this option unless they change that. NVIDIA currently uses regular old linear interpolation for resizing with Turing integer scaling, AKA nearest neighbor scaling, being added as a new feature. Both of these names should be familiar to anyone that's resized a JPEG before. In order to turn a few pixels into a lot of pixels, linear interpolation averages pixels together to fill in the gaps, resulting in a blurred image that's a compromise between speed and accuracy. So for the comments section below, you can keep your opinion on the best resizing algorithm to yourselves. Or you can validate yourselves by posting it. Nearest neighbor scaling just fills in the blanks with the color of the nearest pixel without any interpolation, which is great for keeping pixel art sprites crisp. And NVIDIA's intended use case for the uh, integer scaling feature is running full screen pixel art games that don't natively support 4K like FTL. NVIDIA says adding the feature or the feature is enabled by quote, a hardware accelerated programmable scaling filter available in Turing but nearest neighbor scaling is arguably the crudest possible resizing algorithm. So hopefully the feature makes its way into older hardware. In a recent second quarter 2019 earnings call, NVIDIA CEO Jensen Huan, known for greatest hits like It Just Works uh, and It's Beautiful Look At It, said that the he's all chips in basically on the ray tracing future of the company and uh, also threw some shade at AMD along the way. So answering a question on how the new NVIDIA Superline is doing commercially, Juan said that it is a quote, foregone conclusion that we're going to buy a new graphics card and it's going to last through two years, three years, four years. To not have ray tracing is just crazy. Interestingly enough, Juan did not mention that NVIDIA sells GPUs without ray tracing hardware. So buying a <laughs> GPU without ray tracing is something you could do through NVIDIA as well, but you would be crazy to do it. Man said it himself. Technically, NVIDIA updated its driver stack to bring ray tracing to GTX cards, previous generation 10 series cards, albeit in a very limited fashion and with uh, debatable merits. And to be fair, the non-RTX hardware is more data center, so different target. Uh, Dr. Lisa Su talking about Crossfire support. This is something we asked AMD at their event for the Ryzen and Navi launch what's happening with Crossfire, and they said it'll have about the same support as previously. So what's more recent is that it seems the collective industry is steadily moving away from the once enviable dual GPU setup. NVIDIA has long since abandoned its SLI marketing and ambitions, although it still supports it. And the company recently seems to downplay the idea. With the launch of the Radeon RX 7700 series and their favorable performance in the mid-range segment, the question regarding AMD's position on Crossfire expectedly came up. In short, don't get your hopes up. At Hot Chips 2019, Dr. Lisa Su fielded the question regarding Crossfire support from an attending press member and answered with, quote, to be honest, the software is going faster than the hardware. I would say that Crossfire isn't a significant focus. Uh, in other words, we're giving up. And that's really kind of a terrible answer on the reason why, but also an expected one. AMD's RDNA architecture white paper is out now, and it is very detailed. We'd recommend checking it out. We'll scroll, th scroll through some of it while I go through this coverage of it. So with the AMD 7 nanometer Navi GPUs, the RX 5700 series, AMD also introduced its scalar RDNA graphics architecture. From the start, AMD has been pretty clear about its ambitions with RDNA and how the company plans for the architecture to proliferate from everything to 
smartphones and tablets, all the way up to discrete GPUs, with, quote, big Navi cards rumored to flesh out the upper end of the RX 5 series sometime later. A recent white paper uh, surfaced, and this one details what's under the hood for the RDNA and future products. And quote, thanks to AMD's wide influence and extensive partnerships, the RDNA architecture will roll out and eventually uh, touch nearly every part of the industry. The RDNA family will ultimately grow to include power-constrained smartphone and tablet processors, gaming consoles, cloud gaming services, and a full spectrum of gaming GPUs from low cost to the highest performance, bringing the benefits of the RDNA architecture to millions of devices and people across the planet, says the white paper. So a lot of marketing there, but don't let that get you down because uh, it is a white paper, so there's a lot of technical details too. If you recall, AMD and Samsung already announced that the two companies are planning to work together on phones coming up in a joint agreement to bring RDNA-powered graphics to Samsung's SoC, uh, SOCs that power the mobile devices in Samsung segment, and that's slated to come to market around 2021, if not before. And AMD is also working on custom solutions for the next-gen consoles from both Sony and Microsoft. And they will further have a presence in cloud gaming via Google Stadia. And best we know, Google Stadia is currently running some variant of Vega 56, but presumably the service will migrate to an RDNA-based solution. In AMD's white paper, RDNA's hypervisor agent is mentioned and uh, how it relates to cloud gaming specifically. There's a big block on that that says the hypervisor agent enables the GPU to be virtualized and shared between different operating systems. Most cloud gaming services live in data centers where virtualization is crucial from a security and operational standpoint. While modern consoles focus on gaming, many offer a rich suite of communication and media capabilities and benefit from virtualizing the hardware to deliver performance for all tasks. And finally, that paper outlines RDNA encompassing GPUs from low cost to the highest performance. Uh, AMD has been notably absent from the high-end GPU market for some time, and recent rumors like uh, the Navi 21 and 23 rumors suggest that more might be coming. So anyway, check that white paper out if you want to learn more about Navi and how it works. We also have uh, some architecture discussions from when Navi was first really unveiled back at the press event for Ryzen and Navi. If you want to go back a couple months in time and check those videos. Finally, Intel i5-9600K price drops. So this is a short one, but for those looking for a deal on Intel's K-SKU chips, we didn't particularly recommend any of the Intel i5s after the AMD R5 series launched and started saturating the market. That remains true with the 3000 series. With the 9600K, it was an instance of it being technically better in a lot of the gaming tests, but not. we, we don't really feel great recommending it because unlike the i nine or even the 9700K, now the i7, the 9600K just doesn't offer enough and it's missing too many other important features, so we do give the choice to the R5 almost always. That said, Intel has, has dropped the price, or at least the price has been dropped by the retailers. It's now uh, about $220 on Amazon at time of writing this news segment, so that's $20 lower than the previous price drop, which had brought it down to $240. At launch, it was about 270 for point of reference. So Intel is actually responding to pricing in some ways. Uh, the 9600K, it's six cores, it's six threads, it lacks hyper-threading, but it's overclockable. And we talk about it most heavily in our 3600 review, not the X, but the 3600 if you want to see the comparison between AMD and the 9600K. That's it for this one. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for more. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net to support us directly, like by buying one of these blueprint shirts or our mod mats, or patreon.com slash gamersnexus. I'll see you all next time.